welcome to the Be That 1% podcast. I'm your host, James Silvis, mindset specialist and performance coach. And here on the show, I'm gonna challenge you to think deeper, commit to greatness, and develop a stronger mindset. You'll hear stories from those who are living life on their terms, and you'll receive strategies that will help you level up. So the question is, are you ready to be your own 1%? Let's get started. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Be That 1% podcast. Today, I'm joined with Jake Kaufman, who I had the pleasure of meeting recently in the last 30 to 45 days. And since then, I've purchased his book, Let Love In, great read, and have gotten to know him just a bit deeper through our conversations. And now joining in person, uh, we're going to be talking about all things the book and then also some really, really key components of men, men's work, and just all that encompasses emotionality and challenge and purpose. So I'm excited to dive in. But for those of you who are just now meeting Jake, Jake is an international transformation coach and spiritual mentor, purpose-driven visionary men who works with purpose-driven visionary men and entrepreneurs who are seeking to grow in their life and leadership. He has supported hundreds of men to thrive and reach the next level in all areas of life, business, and relationship, and his mission is to help men radically heal and transform so that they can achieve their full potential and fulfill their purpose. He recently released his first book, uh, and I'm in the process of writing books, so mad props. Um, <laughs> it takes a lot. It's a journey. Yes, and um, and it's called Let Love In, The Pain Stops When the Truth Starts. Love that line. Um, and so excited to dive in with you, brother. Thanks for being here. James, thanks so much for having me. We've been looking forward to this. Yeah. So we're going to start with some rapid fire questions and then Let's we'll jump into the meat. Uh, what is a philosophy that you live by? A philosophy that I live by. Mm. I know this is rapid fire, but I feel like I need to take that one. <laughs> <laughs> I can need to take that yeah. one in. Um, you know, people people don't have business problems. They don't have relationship problems. They just have personal problems that show up in their businesses, in their relationships, and in the rest of their life. Mm. How do you define failure? I think failure is a perspective. I think that all is grace, regardless of what that is or how comfortable, uncomfortable it may be. Mm. What do you wish, uh, what does the world need more of right now? I think the world needs more empathy. Absolutely. Because I think empathy is the doorway to relatability and connection. Hmm. And what, this is a loaded question, so uh, go as shallow or as deep as you want. <laughs> what did you have to let go of mm -hmm. in order to get to where you are now? Pain, truthfully. Mm -hmm. I think the only thing that stands in between people and their goals, their full potential, whatever that looks like for them, is resistance. And resistance is in place, locked in place, due to unresolved pain. Mm. So... Let's start there. Yeah. Uh, lots of people are experiencing pain, whether that's self-inflicted or a story or an emotional blockage, you know, whatever. Sure. What, um, w why is that the mm -hmm. way that it is from your perspective? And, and what are some things that you've learned to do in facing that pain, healing that pain, learning from that pain? Sure. Well, I think... At the crux of this conversation is understanding how the ego functions, the mm -hmm. ego being the false self, this identity that we unconsciously start to construct as children based on who we think we need to be mm -hmm. in order to be loved, accepted, and successful. Mm -hmm. This largely shapes our personality, but it's not who we are authentically. Who we are authentically is separate from that, right? So it's really just this big performance, our personality in many ways. It's a series of masks that we wear, persona literally being the Latin word for mask. So our personality is this amalgamation of genuine traits, of course, but also these adaptive traits or compensating strategies that we pick up on throughout the course of childhood in order to be loved, accepted, and successful. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to the ego, the number one goal of the ego is to maintain the status quo. And the best way for it to do that is to hide the truth from you. 
status quo quo being what I'm used to or Correct. what I think things need to be? What I'm used to, what is known and what is familiar. Mm -hmm. This is why the saying exists, it's better the devil you know than the devil you don't. Right. So we'll just say that the goal of the ego is to keep you stuck in your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. Anything outside of that feels like a threat or is perceived as a threat, even if it's not necessarily a threat. So in order to in order to grow, we have to first and foremost start with the question, okay, what is keeping you from growth? Mm -hmm. Which is why the entirety of men's work starts with the question, what have you been doing with your pain? And when you confront that, in order to confront that, truth needs to be told at some level. Correct. To self, to the public, which in which one of the things that you've done, which I'm sure we'll get into. Absolutely. And you know, going back to the ego hiding the truth from you, our unconscious mind dictates 90 to 95% of our behavior. Mm -hmm. So these are all behavior patterns, habits that have an underlying unconscious motivation that's rooted in something yeah. or it's a attached somewhere. Yeah. Like I mentioned, most of which is picked up and formulated early on in childhood. And we just continue to play out those patterns on repeat, right. which I talk about extensively in the context of the book where I noticed myself continuing to repeat similar patterns. And even though I didn't necessarily have language, this language for it at the time, the pattern always reveals the problem. And so when we think about ascending to higher levels of abundance, whether it's greater degree of, of abundance, financially speaking, in relationships, when it comes to opportunity, we have to talk about the things that are preventing that from happening mm -hmm. first and foremost mm -hmm. before we can dissolve or in order to dissolve the resistance that prevents us from achieving those things. Yeah. Do you find that the ego uh, is is mostly for protection? Like, does it all boil down to protection? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, that That is the, it's self-protection by way of assuring yeah. love, acceptance, and success. Because if you think about it from a primal perspective, if I'm not accepted, I am rejected. Right. And to be rejected in a, in a primal sense was a death sentence. Mm -hmm. If you were cast out of the tribe, that, that quite literally was a death sentence. And so that wiring is still instinctually baked into us where we have this primal need to be accepted, to be included. And so our ego is going to do whatever it takes in order to accomplish that, including masking or performing, taking on these adaptive traits or compensating strategies in an attempt to do so that are not actually who we are authentically. It's mm -hmm. simply who we think we need to be. Mm -hmm. But that creates tension yes. because there is this separation that is playing itself out between who we think we need to be and who we are authentically. I truly believe that that is what is at the source of so much of anxiety, depression nowadays. If you really boil it down to the root of, of everything, of course, there's all these external circumstances that, that play a role and play a part. But in my experience, all of that is an external manifestation of a deeper internal wounding that has yet to be reconciled and worked mm -hmm. through. With your work, is it mostly with men? Or is it a combination? Yeah, it's exclusively with men now. Okay. I used to serve both men and women years ago when I first got into coaching, but have been exclusively working with men for a few years now, uh, simply given that I do think at a certain point in time, we can only do so much work on ourselves. Eventually, it has to, it has to evolve when it comes to, to working with other people and in the context of relationship. Mm -hmm. And so that's what ultimately prompted me to step into not just doing this work with individuals, but doing it in the company of a group of men. Yeah. And a couple of years ago, you had the courage to share something about you that I have very few people knew. Mm -hmm. And when you did, something happened. Yeah. That I'm sure you didn't anticipate <laughs> or expect. And, not and, in the slightest. And from there, um, have gained deeper understanding of of what it takes to live authentically right. in your truth and, mm -hmm. and have the courage to speak that. Can you walk us through? Yeah. So for, for context purposes, for those who haven't read the book, 
the book essentially picks up with me acknowledging that what I experienced when I was roughly 12 or 13 was sexual abuse. Now, this was 15, 15 years later, roughly, when I was 27, 28 years old. And I started, like I mentioned, to notice myself repeating certain patterns that were preventing me from living the life that I wanted, creating the life that I wanted, achieving the goals that I desired. And so it, it forced me into this season of self-introspection where I was asking myself, what is behind that? What, what is motivating this? What's causing me to repeat these patterns? You know, same song, different dance, mm -hmm. right? Just a different set of circumstances, whether it was in a different romantic relationship, whether it was in a different job. I wanted to figure out, I needed to figure out what was driving the behavior that was causing me to repeat these patterns. And so I started to seek counseling and went to therapy. Through that, I ended up acknowledging that what I experienced when I was 12 or 13 was sexual abuse and, and really started to do some deep interpersonal work and, and healing around that experience because I started to see how that in many ways was the catalyst for so many different parts of my personality mm -hmm. where I started to mask, where I started to develop these compensating strategies in order to protect myself. Yeah. And in order to ensure that that never happened again, right? And and so some of the ways in which I did that, which is very com which is a very common male experience, um, especially in today's age where I think more men are waking up to this reality. I started to act as if, act as if I had it all together. I was fine. I was successful, or I was even vulnerable when when really I was I was still masking. I was still controlling the narrative in a way that prevented people from seeing the real me. Mm -hmm. I would show them parts of me, but then I would still hide these other less than ideal qualities, traits, or characteristics about myself, which as you can imagine, creates a pressure cooker. Yeah. Because energetically and emotionally, I'm working so hard to Conflict. hide, right, to hide these parts of myself and to further posture and position these other parts of myself. And like you mentioned, it has me at odds within myself. Mm -hmm. And there's this internal conflict and turmoil that is continuing to, to occur because there's not this integration between these more shameful parts of myself and these more ideal parts of myself. And so I started to work through that and, and heal, heal that experience and, and break through the, the different ways in which I was masking and how that was manifesting in my life. And eventually that led me into a career of coaching and, and supporting people in the way that I do. At the time, it was both men and women. And four years later, this was early 2019 now, I felt called to share about my story of sexual abuse because the one thing that became clear throughout my time coaching people is that so many people mm -hmm. have been through something similar have experienced something similar, whether it's sexual abuse or assault or even just simply emotional abuse or verbal abuse, but they had never shared it with anyone. They hadn't fully reconciled it and worked through it. Yeah. And here I am supporting them on achieving their goals, creating a, a better, more abundant life for them, whatever that looks like. And it always came back to these series of unresolved or unreconciled events that they were continuing to unconsciously play out mm -hmm. that manifested fear, resistance, and self-doubt in a way that prevented them from accomplishing what they really want. And when I did, like you said, I shared it on social media to inspire others, like I mentioned, yeah. to step into their healing journey. And when I did, my nervous system completely collapsed. So I suffered from what is clinically referred to as an acute nervous system breakdown. So I immediately experienced nausea, vertigo, an incredible amount of anxiety, essentially a panic attack on steroids yeah. is the best way to put it, and started going back to therapy. And through that, what I realized with my therapist was that all of these masks that I started to wear as a result of the abuse and unconsciously reinforced over the course of two decades now, because this would have been when I was 32, the event happened when I was roughly 12 or 13, were stripped away from me in that moment. 
there was no hiding because mm-hmm. now everyone knows my most shameful secret. So all of these compensating strat- strategies that I had unconsciously adopted in order to self-protect were no longer available to me. And the amount of connection, because I just started to receive so many messages, calls, DMs on social media from people who had been through something similar or who had questions or who wanted to share their story of abuse or assault with me, it was too much for my nervous system to handle. And it sent me into a just a completely dysregulated state. For How long did that last? The nausea and the vertigo lasted probably for, it was very brief, an hour or two maybe. Mm-hmm. But the dysregulation lasted for months, mm. probably seven months. I started to experience regular panic attacks. Randomly. Randomly. Oh yeah, totally. I mean, I remember going into the grocery store and I was just sobbing in like the cereal aisle. And like couldn't hold it together. Couldn't. No matter how hard you tried. Couldn't hold it together. It was wild, man. Sharing my story, it it essentially had me tap into a well of grief that I didn't even know was there because I had spent the previous like three, four years dealing with this and working through this myself, but in the context of a therapy relationship sure. or a counseling or coaching relationship. So it's very private. Yeah. But the minute I put it out there and now everyone knows about it, friends, family members, clients, uh, even strangers, because it was it was a public post, so anyone could technically see it or access it. It was so dysregulating, and it forced me to into connection, mm-hmm. which for me and for my nervous system felt like a threat because of the abuse that I experienced. What was the association to connection that got re, got changed or redefined? Well, connection didn't feel safe at that point. Because okay. past a certain point, past a certain point, the intimacy, part. exactly. Yep, intimacy, uh, deep connection, vulnerability fundamentally felt unsafe, mm-hmm. even though I think we can objectively sure. both agree that those things are the doorway to a greater degree of love and intimacy and yeah. uh, deeper relationships. But for my nervous system, because of the abuse, it was it was essentially confused, and that's what trauma does. It causes us to experience something as a threat that isn't technically a threat. Mm-hmm. Um, so it caused me to rewrite this narrative around what love and connection and intimacy is. And so, because for greater context, my abuse happened in the company of other people. So it was like this really sick joke that just went way too far mm. and was incredibly inappropriate. And all of my friends that I grew up with were present for it and nobody tried to stop it. And so here I am thinking, all yeah. of you- Who can I rely on? Who can who I trust? Who can I rely on? Who can I trust? If, if you guys don't have my back, who will? Mm-hmm. Because we've been, you know, we're K through 12 together. Uh, granted, we were 12 or 13 at the time, but these are, most of these guys, I don't remember not knowing. And so the amount of trust there prior to the incident was incredibly high. The amount of connection. Betrayal too. Right. Was incredibly high. And so it led to this deep, deep feeling of betrayal and a lack of safety when it came to being able to trust other people, especially as we increase in the depth of connection. Right. So to your point, I found myself being able to go deep within a relationship, but to a certain point Mm -hmm. before my body, before my nervous system was like, that's far enough. What would you do at those points? Would you just end the conversation? Would you walk out? Would you just withdraw and just go mute? All of the above. (laughs) Depending on the person. (laughs) Yeah, depending on the person and the situation, I would simply put, I would self-sabotage, which simply means to to self-protect. Yeah. Because the depth of connection felt unsafe, I needed to return to safety. And the best way to do that was to self-sabotage. Yes. So I would end the conversation. I would walk out. I would find some seemingly insignificant reason or justification, conscious justification to break off the relationship. Mm. Because that's what 
our ego needs in order to keep us trapped in these limited ways of thinking, yeah. doing, and being is it needs to rationalize it mm -hmm. and it needs to come up with some sort of conscious justification to keep the pattern alive yeah. and to keep it going. Because if it can, that's how it keeps us repeating the pattern. Yeah. Well, and if it keeps it intact, then it can predict. Correct. Predict. A hundred percent. Right. Yep. Um, and and I, I imagine that the ego is looking at it more so from like home as opposed to trapped. Right? Correct. When you look at it outside, it's like that is a trap. Like you're trapping yourself. And then the ego is like, right. no, nah, bro. Like, right, right. Yeah. Trying to keep you safe. <laughs> exactly. You know? Exactly. Even though it is, even though it's wildly ineffective, mm -hmm. it still feels safe. Yeah. Like you mentioned. The ego would always rather be right about what doesn't serve us than wrong about what does. And so if we want to grow, if we wish to ascend to higher levels of or greater degrees of abundance, whatever that looks like for you, we have to go in search of the internal barriers within us yeah. that stand between us and whatever it is we want. I think uh, Rumi puts this beautifully when he says, our task is not to seek after love but to seek after and find the barriers within us that stand against love. I love that. So in your, throughout those seven months and even up until now, what qualities have you noticed emerge through the work mm -hmm. that weren't there before that maybe you were hiding or not expressing or maybe you didn't even know that they were there? Sure. Well, simply put, the more I do this work, mm -hmm. the better... And I realize that it's a very subjective, broad term, but I will say the greater degree of abundance I experience in every facet of my life, whether it's related to my business, um, success within my career, uh, love within the context of my partnership and romantic relationship, opportunities like this with you, you know, for example, being able to write this book, honestly, doing this work was pivotal to this book existing in the first place because I didn't, I didn't want to write this book because it constantly forced me back into my pain. Mm -hmm. And even though I had done a significant amount of work through that, it still forced me to wrestle with these different things because as you can probably imagine, and you're experiencing this yourself, I imagine, mm -hmm. through the process of writing, new awareness is created. Yeah around all of the different facets of what you've been through and how that's impacted you and how that continues to manifest in your life. And you're forced into grieving. And that's what I experienced. And so doing this work in many ways has become a lifestyle for me. You know, I brush my teeth every day. I shower every day. I brush twice a day. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, no. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, but this interpersonal transformational work mm -hmm. has become the exact same for me. And like I mentioned, the more I do it, the better every other area of my life works as a result. Do you find that the more you do this, when you're in connection with somebody, the more you just don't, you lose, like you isn't even a thing anymore. Correct. Like you're just presence. Yeah. There is no, there is no Jake Kaufman. Right. This book is, about me, but it's not meant for me. That's one of the things that you said in your book that I really liked that I wanted to uh, talk to you about is you say your story is about you, but it's not meant for you. Yeah. Tell me, like when you when you wrote that, what yep. were you what were you trying to say there? Well, I think when you start to do this interpersonal work, you become less attached to the idea of myself you become less focused on answering the question, what do I want? And you become more focused on answering the question, what can I contribute? Mm -hmm. Purpose. Purpose fundamentally is much, much bigger than any individual, including myself. So this book, this work that I do, it's not about me. First and foremost, it's about the work. Yeah. Um, that's something that my partner Carrie and I are talking about all the time. It's about the work first and foremost. Yeah. It's about how we show up to the work and our ability to serve people through the work. And lastly, it's about us. And it's not that it's not a priority. It's just that it doesn't take precedence. 
And by virtue of that, we're able to have this higher level of perspective or more elevated perspective around the fact that this is not about us. This is about what we can contribute to, in my case, to men and to the conversation around, for example, healthy masculinity uh, or wounded masculinity and how I specifically can be a catalyst for transformation yeah. so that men experience the growth and the healing that they need to no, no longer be trapped in limitation. So yeah, t so let's go to that then. What in your mind, what does it mean to be a man? Mm. You can answer that or this, what does it mean to ha have like be a healthy masculine? Sure. Be in sure. a healthy masculine. Yeah, absolutely. Well, if, cause that can absolutely be a, a pretty controversial <laughs> topic mm -hmm. these days, especially and and rightfully so in many ways. But I think if we look at classical virtues, because a lot of classical virtues are inherently masculine in nature, in energy and in essence, it doesn't have anything to do with gender in particular. But if we look at the classical virtues like justice, wisdom, courage, self-restraint, we start to get this, this blueprint for what it looks like to be a man in today's day and age. And we can start to formulate different habits and behavior patterns around those virtues that have us develop a set of core values, for example, mm -hmm. who I am, what I'm about, what's important to me in my life that keeps us on the path to love and purpose. I think Viktor Frankl puts this very beautifully when he says that life is about three things. It's about love purpose and suffering in order to return to love and purpose. Mm -hmm. And so if love and purpose is the goal, how can I develop, formulate different core values and habits and behavior patterns that support those core values that continually contribute towards a greater degree of love and purpose in my life? Yeah. That I become a catalyst for love that I live into my purpose, which is so much bigger than me, right? It's mm -hmm. about being in contribution and in service to other people and humanity. So if I'm hearing you right, healthy masculine would be purpose-driven and led by the heart or yeah. love? Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think the Incan culture has a really beautiful way of describing this, which is that a fully embodied or integrated man has his sword in one hand and his heart in another. Unfortunately, we're seeing two extremes mm -hmm. today when it comes to masculinity, when it comes to the manifestation of wounded masculinity, which is you have a lot of men walking around with two swords. This is like the hyper masculine or this hyper vigilant That's doer. A cool analogy, yeah. Yeah, this hyper vigilant doer that is focused on the pursuit of power, possession, and prestige. And then you have this other wounded masculine that has, is walking around with two hearts that is overly passive, that is bent on people pleasing, very, very codependent. Both of them are doing the same thing. Mm. They're both overcompensating just in opposite directions of one another. Yeah. Would you say the 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 mind is is correlated with the sword? Like maybe they're too heavy in the mind and not integrated into heart or emotion? I, I think I think the sword is I think it refers to masculine ambition. Okay. Because a man without a purpose is lost. Is lost. It truly a ship out to sea without a rudder, without a direction. And so I think the the sword is kind of this analogy for this warrior archetype mm -hmm. that is driven and expands through purpose mm -hmm. and through specific goals. So I think it's less about, you know, being equipped with like certain self-defense skills. And it's, mm -hmm. it's much more so about clarity of purpose, direction, assertiveness, having a, a mission and a vision for yeah. how I can be of highest service and greatest benefit to humanity and to other people. Mm. And then the two hearts obviously is not using any logic or just getting too lost in your feelings and kind of just spinning in circles. 
Right. Yeah, absolutely. Because the overly passive man who is actively people pleasing is going to have a very difficult time excelling in this world because he's constantly placating to other people and operating as a victim to circumstance mm -hmm. in, in, in my experience. Yeah. So it's, it's very hard for that person to live into purpose and be assertive and determined and goal oriented in a healthy way, mm -hmm. in, in a balanced way that ultimately allows them to, you know, contribute to greater humanity. Have you found in the work that you do, like, is there, are there certain components of a purpose that help someone orient effectively or have a, a strong direction that pulls them forward? Yeah, I think it starts with a certain set of core values. Absolutely. But then I think having a, a mission and a vision is, is very, mm -hmm. is very important. A mission being this broader overall objective for who I am and why I'm here. I think Leo Tolstoy said it best, without knowing who I am and why I'm here, life is impossible. And a vision is, what does that specifically look like in action? Mm -hmm. I like that. And all of that being bigger than you, bigger than the individual. Correct. Yep. So for me, my vision was, or excuse me, my mission was to write a life-changing book that served to inspire other people into their healing journey and to be a catalyst for growth and transformation. What that looked like specifically was this book. Mm -hmm. Cool. I love that. Yeah. Another thing that I that I really liked that you wrote about in the book was this uh, Norwegian expression, this term. Do you know sure. how to say it? It's like for for a less <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, you, you pretty much got it. Okay, cool. Yeah. yeah. So basically what I, I read from your book is it's the euphoria you feel when you begin to fall in love with something or someone. Mm -hmm. And then do, can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Like how, how have you applied that in your life towards yourself and towards others to carry to sure. your work? Well, love forces us beyond ourselves. It It forces us to see beyond the ego, see beyond our own selfish pursuits, uh, similar to purpose. And that's why I think that that Viktor Frankl quote is so perfect, that life is about three things, love, purpose, and suffering in order to return to love and purpose. It's this greater reason for being, doing, and living that points us in the direction where all of a sudden life is, is no longer about us. Mm -hmm. Right, my life is no longer about me. So I, I think that's kind of what what that phrase is getting to it is really cultivating a greater internal capacity for both giving and receiving love. Yeah, the so love, purpose, and suffering to get back to the love. Right, and, that's and, and purpose. And yeah. Purpose. So his idea, how he came up with that, was if you're not familiar with Viktor Frankl, he wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning. And his entire family was imprisoned and ultimately killed in the concentration camps during World War II uh, in Europe. And what he found while he was in prison was because they separated the men and the women. Mm -hmm. What he found was that the men who survived, they were primarily focused on two things, getting back to their work and to their women, work being purpose, women being love. And so it was in that moment that he's like, okay, love and purpose and suffering in order to return to love and purpose. Got it. That's cool. Which is, I mean, in many ways is to say a return to our true and authentic selves. Transformation is way more about unbecoming, unlearning than it is about becoming anything. Mm -hmm. It's predicated um, yeah, on dying to something. It. Yeah. So one of the lines, the line on your book said, the yeah. pain stops when the truth starts. Yeah. Is that a certain type of pain? Because mm -hmm. I would, I have found that when you tell the truth, it is freeing, but it also brings a new pain, maybe even a suffering yeah. in some ways to maintain that or to combat the unforeseen things that can happen once the truth is spoken. Right. Well, I think until until we reconcile the pain from the past, we're mm -hmm. only going to continue to recycle True. it in the present moment. Right. So admittedly, the 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 <laughs> phrase is <laughs> the phrase is incomplete. Yeah. But it provides us with a basis for what does a first step look like? Yeah. 
I've never been through a 12 step program, admittedly, but the first step in any 12 step program is admitting our weakness or our pain and that we are powerless over it. Mm -hmm. We are powerless over our addiction. Well, what fuels addiction? Pain. If you're familiar with uh, Gabor Mate, the psychotherapist, mm -hmm. right? He's becoming incredibly popular, especially on social media nowadays. He says that the, the wrong question is why the addiction, the right question is why the pain. Mm -hmm. And so I think the statement provides us with a basis for where do I even begin in this journey of transformation, of unbecoming, of deconstructing so that I can reconstruct, so yeah. that I can live up to my full potential, so that I can achieve this greater purpose, knowing that I am here for a reason, mm -hmm. for a bigger purpose to fulfill that ultimately contributes to the betterment of humanity. It provides us with a first step. Love that. Working with so many men, you know, over the last couple of years, are there any, what, what are the common traits that you find that men typically ignore that prevent mm -hmm. them from a, a greater level of fulfillment, success, yep. love, you name it? Mm, that's a really good question. I think most men are asking themselves the wrong question. I think most men are stuck in the conversation of what do I want? as opposed to analyzing why do I want it? What is the underlying unconscious motivation beneath the conscious desire? Mm -hmm. Because in my experience, what you often find most times in most cases is that this high performance game that most men are playing in an attempt to achieve their goals, whatever those goals are, is typically a compensating strategy to make up or to claim victory over their pain. Yeah, I would agree with that. And playing devil's advocate, what's wrong with that? There's nothing inherently wrong with that. Yeah. There's nothing inherently wrong with being driven or goal oriented or having a growth mindset per se. All of those things are good in many respects. But and I'm sure you've experienced this in the process mm -hmm. of your coaching, the amount of successful people that I've worked with or who I've just come across in, in my daily life and, and through the work that I do, who are wildly successful but do not know peace, it's the vast majority mm -hmm. because they're ultimately after the wrong thing. On some inherent level, they think that a particular goal or accomplishment or reaching a certain level in life or in relationship or in business is going to provide them with a certain degree of happiness and fulfillment, but it has them looking outside of themselves to something external to fill an internal void. Mm -hmm. And that's just not how happiness and fulfillment works. Because if you're not enough without it, you'll never be enough with it. Yeah, you can't out hustle your your insecurity. Absolutely. Yeah. No, and you can't out achieve it either. Right. Right. You'll just, you know, find yourself with more money, but you'll you'll wonder why you feel the same way. In your research with either your clients or just someone maybe publicly known, have you found someone who's from your eyes operated in this uh less being driven by insecurity and more driven by love, mm -hmm. purpose, meaning? Yeah. That you're like, that person gets it. The first person that comes to mind is a, a man by the name of Richard Rohr, who's a Franciscan friar mm -hmm. and who has written at least a half a dozen books on masculinity, on men's work. Um, I think I have one in my backpack here, actually. <laughs> um, but he, he wrote about this in his book called Adam's Return, mm -hmm. which is all about returning to our true self our authenticity adam being at you know adam and eve mm -hmm. in the garden and that when adam quote unquote sinned it was simply a metaphor for the fracture or the separation that occurred that caused him to disconnect 
from from God or from himself, his true nature, his true essence, which was perfection, right? Because God created them in his image, in his likeness, which is which means that they were perfect in, yeah. his, in his eyes. And the return is all about reconciling that separation, bridging that gap that was caused with, you know, this original sin, quote unquote, so that they could come back to God, that they could come back to their true self, their authentic self, and realize that they never left it. Mm -hmm. I like that. That's cool. I'm thinking of, of all the men that are listening, and I'm thinking of also my past clients and, and questions that might be arising based on what you're saying. And I think a lot of men use their pain as fuel. Absolutely. Right? And if they weren't to have that anymore, their fear is that they won't be as successful or as sharp mm -hmm. because pain has is effective at doing that. But of course right? it is. What's the sustainability on that? Probably not. Well, it's kind of like gasoline. Yeah, exactly. Gasoline is an incredible fuel. Mm -hmm. It burns hot, but it goes out fast. And, and that's why so many men wrestle with anxiety, depression, burnout, overwhelm. So while they may be materially, circumstantially, financially successful or abundant, internally they don't know peace. Yeah. And that only serves to further reinforce the internal conflict and turmoil that they feel inside because they were looking to this thing to satisfy an internal void mm -hmm. and were very disappointed to find out that that's just simply not how transformation works. Yeah. What have you noticed from you specifically or even your clients that once you're once the client or you go to that peaceful mm -hmm. place and yeah. experience what that's like? Yep. How what is how is life different compared to what we're talking about? Just to kind of give uh, an example of what the incentive is mm -hmm. to want to do that. Because I imagine the person who's driven by pain, who's trying to be successful, prove yeah. his dominance, be yeah. quote unquote the alpha, is not one creating time to think about the other side. Sure. Right? Maybe yep. because of all the superficial attention that they're getting from social mm -hmm. media, from their friends, from the industry itself, yeah. like lots of elements. Absolutely. Well, what What's the incentive for the other side? Like, what are they not thinking about that if they hear might be like, oh, well, maybe I should look into this? I think that the measure of success for a man is how does he feel when he sits in silence in a room alone? I have been giving my clients that homework ever since I started coaching more than half a decade ago. And it consistently, time and time again, proves to be the most difficult thing that they do. Not these difficult conversations to reconcile a relationship or to forgive someone or to communicate how someone wronged or hurt them or to apologize or anything like that. It's to be with themselves because when we be with ourselves, we're forced to confront the, emo the emotions that we've been unconsciously avoiding. Mm -hmm. Amy Morton, who is the author of 13 Things Mentally Strong People, I think, don't do. Um, <laughs> when she was on my podcast, I was asking yeah. her, like, what, what's an experiment that you heard of that was completely shocking to you? And she yeah. said there was an experiment done where they took two groups of people and they were given a choice between sitting in silence for 15 minutes or undergoing electric shock. And I think it was like 85, 90% of the people chose the electric shock rather than sitting by themselves in well, silence. There you go. You know? There you go. Most men don't know peace because they are unconsciously overcompensating in an attempt to avoid their pain, which is to avoid themselves. Mm -hmm. And so until we reconcile our pain, we won't know peace. We will... You'll do exactly what I did until, <laughs> for years, decades. You will simply continue to perform your way around the pain. How does someone know if they're operating in a pain-driven, insecure, fear-based model? How do you feel internally when you're at rest? Okay. And if they say, I feel anxious, mm -hmm. I feel stressed i feel um 
less than, mm -hmm. then those are all indications that there's something to look at there. I think it's a sign that you're overcompensating. That when all of a sudden you slow down, then you're forced to, to mm -hmm. feel. And when you're forced to feel, well, then you're met with reality, with what's really going on within you internally. Mm -hmm. And so if that's the case, well, then what am I overcompensating for? Because when you overcompensate, you're going to need a coping mechanism. You will. Alcohol, drugs, sex. Well, and, and here's the yes. <laughs> yes, to answer your question. But I think we can all agree that, you know, it's easy to condemn those those coping mechanisms, despite the fact that they, they serve a role and they play they a do. purpose because right. they are self-protective strategies um, or self-soothing strategies, I should say. But the more sinister and what I refer to as noble coping mechanisms that we need to look out for are, for example, working out and being obsessed with my health and fitness or my diet and nutrition justified behind the guise of being health conscious mm -hmm. or work being justified behind the guise of having a strong work, work ethic, providing for the family, wanting to leave a lasting legacy, mm -hmm. or even serving and giving to others, caretaking, justified behind the guise of being servant-hearted mm -hmm. or being selfless. All of those are our coping mechanisms as well mm -hmm. in an unconscious attempt to avoid pain. And would it be fair to say that basically anything taken to the extreme is a form of overcompensating? Yeah. Right. Uh, simply put, um, and, and I don't want to make these coping mechanisms wrong. Sure. I think one of the biggest mistakes, especially in the world of men's coaching, is shaming people for their coping mechanisms. Because <laughs> yeah. whenever you tell someone to stop something, you are inherently shaming them. <laughs> and, yeah. and too much of that is going on, um, especially when it comes to like porn addiction, for example. Um, men are being shamed into, into changing. And that simply doesn't work. Because the only thing that it ends up accomplishing is it further reinforces the notion that they need to hide, yeah. which creates an even greater degree of tension and internal conflict and turmoil. Yeah. But so I don't want to make these coping mechanisms wrong. You, you shouldn't be too quick to get rid of your coping mechanisms before you learn what's why beneath there, them. Yeah. yeah. Why they're there and what they have to teach you. So I think that we have a long way to go and a lot of work to do when it comes to becoming, for lack of a better phrase, trauma-informed. Because in my experience, the more you do this work, eventually you will have less and less a need for these different coping mechanisms. Even if it's just busyness, mm -hmm. which I think is a chronic, uh, chronic form of dysregulation in our society in general. We, we don't know how to slow down. Yeah. And, and we're constantly going from one thing to the next to the next, which is just normalizing stress and causing people to struggle even further with anxiety, depression, and burnout. Am I going too fast? Am I going too slow? Right. Well, what's the right and and the, stati <laughs> the statistics back this up. Last year in the US alone, over 350 million prescriptions were written for anxiety just anti-anxiety medication. We're more stressed than ever before. Mm -hmm. We sleep less than ever before. It's wild. And it's having a dramatic effect on, especially men's mental health. Men are 30% more likely to commit suicide, I believe. Yeah. When I think, is it 50% of men under the age of 30 or 35 haven't had sex in the last year either? It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's we're like, we're moving further and further apart. Yeah. Even and though the access to connection is f the closest it's ever been. Right. One in five men report having no significant close male friendships. That's insane. Staggering. Staggering. 20% of the population, of the male population. So 
you know, my hope, my goal was that this, this serve as a wake up call mm -hmm. for people who are, are trapped in suffering and, and simply running from themselves and justifying it behind the guise of being growth minded mm -hmm. or goal oriented. But in a way that, not that there's anything wrong with those things, right? I think it's great to have goals in many ways, like I mentioned earlier, a man without a purpose, which is just to say a man without goals is lost. Mm -hmm. But overcompensating insofar that they don't know peace. Because I have not, I've never worked with a man who has woken up to this reality that they are overcompensating, who hasn't radically altered his his goals or his ambitions at least initially mm -hmm. at least initially that's kind of a key to deconstruction in many ways is all of a sudden letting go of these attachments to certain ways of living doing and being certain habits and behaviors that used to largely shape us but now we've woken up to the reality for why those were intact in the first place and the beautiful thing about all of this is because some people accuse me of saying, so you're saying not to have goals. <laughs> like, no, I'm not saying that. I'm definitely not saying that. Eventually, you will return to where you once started, but you will know it for the first time. And your relationship will have completely changed with whatever your goals are. You will no longer need that goal that accomplishment because more only makes you want more the next level only makes you want the next level yeah and so what i find time and time again in my work with men is that they get more <laughs> they achieve more they get to the next level but they're left empty and wanting mm -hmm. i'm thinking of myself right now as you're talking and i think about the purpose that i have i think about me reaching new levels. Mm -hmm. I think about me playing a growth oriented game where there is no end, yeah. an infinite game, if you will. Yeah. I've, I've, I operate with loving the process and the, the building of the mastery, the yeah. gift, the craft. Of course. And as you're talking, I'm like thinking about, okay, what questions uh, am I, I'm thinking, am I overcompensating in any of those areas? And maybe there are times where I work more, but, and maybe, because of the demand or maybe it's because I'm not wanting to sit with something that's coming up that yep. my kids are showing me. <laughs> um, and I guess the answers that are coming up as you're talking aren't ones that are, that do, they don't feel sure in like they're, I'm overcompensating. Yeah. And, and so I guess I'm trying to figure out for the listener, what's the, the cue of like, I'm good. And I guess mm -hmm. it comes back to you when you're resting, how do you mm -hmm. feel? In many ways. In many yeah. ways. And, and there are times where when I am resting, I want to keep going. Sure. You know? Which I'm not going to necessarily say there's a deeper, more sinister yeah. issue that you haven't addressed or you haven't reconciled. It could simply be yeah. that on some level you've normalized stress that has you in a constant state of going right. or doing. And so the minute you slow down, your system just returns to what you've been practicing yeah, or is tempted to return to what you've been practicing. Right. right? And, and therefore you could be on the beach with your family mm -hmm. and you're like, why am I anxious? Why do I feel like I need to like check my email or am tempted to like send this message or whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. Um, it could just be that on some degree you've normalized stress or you've become addicted to whatever internalized state you operate in most frequently mm -hmm. that has you struggle at the very least with, with being present yeah, and practicing perfect presence mm -hmm. because peace is only available to us in the present moment. It's true. Yeah. And then I think about all the times I'm present when I'm working is definitely one of those times. Sure. Uh, when I'm connected with my kids and I'm having fun, definitely at those times when I'm yeah. out date nights with my wife. So there, there are periods of time and environment, environmental cues that 
I fall into those moments more easily. Mm -hmm. And then there's, you know, the intermittent times where I'm like, hmm, I want to go record something because sure. it's like I have this thought and then. Yeah. yeah so. And it, and it could just, it could be passion. Yeah. Because passion is an incredible driver. I think the issue that we, that I've discovered with a lot of the men that I've coached is it's not passion that's driving them. Yeah. Although that's what their ego convinces them that they're doing. Because if you do anything long enough, you become good at it. Yeah. And when you become good at something, you, you become- You tend to like it. You tend to like it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. right. And so naturally, yeah. you're going to consciously think, well, the reason that I want to do this thing is because I love it so much. And you're like, okay, yes, that is true. But what is the underlying unconscious motivation that's really beneath that? Mm -hmm. And whenever I sit with a man long enough, and you start to really unpack their past, what they've struggled with, what they've gone through in the past, and what they're wrestling with in the present, the vast majority of the time, despite the, the conscious external reality that they are passionate about what they do, they're, they're motivated or driven to, to do more of it or to go deeper into it. But if you go back to the mental point of origin, what was the initial cause for all of this mm -hmm. was that it was an overcompensation to avoid pain Got it. or to make up for some internal deficiency. Mm -hmm. They're trying to prove something to themselves or to someone else that they are a success or that they're not who they on some deep internal level believe themselves to be. Yeah. So- I'm thinking about, you know, assuming the podcast is all about being that 1%. And that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, be the top 1% financially or the industry. It's more so be your own 1%. Be right. you, right? You're one of one. Yep. Um, but I, assuming that someone wants to be the best in mm -hmm. an industry, like mm -hmm. an athlete or, yep. you know, uh, in business, they want to reach X level, in your opinion, operating yep. in the way that you said. Yeah right? With peace and, and alignment and integrity. What is the likelihood that someone reaches, let's call it that pinnacle, sure. whether it's right or wrong, yep. like yep. what are the odds? I mean, the, the pure and simple answer is I don't know, mm -hmm. but here's what I, here's what I do know. I know that that won't be your primary goal anymore. Your primary goal will be peace, happiness, love, and fulfillment. And becoming the best will simply be a natural byproduct of you stepping more and more into those things. Because mm -hmm. the more you cultivate those things, what, are you, what, are, what is going to happen? You're going to relax. The more I cultivate an internal degree of happiness, peace, joy, and fulfillment, the more I relax. And when I relax, what do I do as a natural byproduct of that? I do what comes most naturally to me, what is most authentic to me, what I enjoy and love doing. Mm -hmm. Right? For me, it's it's cooking, it's it's playing golf, it's writing. And the more I do that, the better I become at those things. Yeah. The issue is, is that most people have that equation backwards mm -hmm. they're in pursuit of those things but at the cost of joy happiness peace and fulfillment mm -hmm. so they're sacrificing those at the altar of their success so let's look at some pop culture uh examples right and obviously we won't know their whole story and their elements that we'll never know i got three great ones for Please. you anthony bourdain kate spade and robin williams okay anthony bourdain was arguably quite easily the biggest food celebrity in the world. Robin Williams has won multiple Academy Awards, one of the best comedians of all time, an incredible actor who's been in some of my favorite movies. I mean, Good Will Hunting, come on. Yeah, so good. Right? And then Kate Spade, she was making $50 million a month. All of these people- Top of the industry. Top yeah. of their respective industries, and all of them committed suicide. They did not know peace. 
despite their success, despite being the best. Those are great examples. Um, what do you think about Kobe Bryant or um, let's say Taylor Swift? Hyper vigilant doer. Okay. And so what does that mean? And what are the elements of that that should be analyzed further? Mm -hmm. uh, because I know a lot of men look up to, let's say, Kobe. Mamba sure. mentality, right? Push yeah. through. And right. from his interviews, he talks about how much he loved the game and there was sure. nothing else that he loved more. Maybe his family, but like sure. that sacrificed because of his drive, let's say, sure. for basketball. Obviously, I didn't know Kobe sure. <laughs> personally. Yeah. But, you know, if we use a really, a really relevant example um, that I think will paint the picture of the mentality Mm -hmm. Because it's less about Kobe and it's sure. more about the mentality that you talked about. It's like, like iconic, yeah. Right, this this yeah. mama mentality of like, I think David Data says this really beautifully in his book that men who are prone to push, push, push mm -hmm. are most often that is driven by an unconscious attempt to claim victory over their lack of self-worth. Mm -hmm. I'd agree with that. Gary Vandertruck is an incredible, incredible businessman, entrepreneur, and I love the work that he's doing and, and who he's, a, what he's about as a person. Mm -hmm. And I mean, his, the way in which he has preached, you know, kindness as a competitive advantage is very admirable and, and everyone I think should uh, subscribe to on, on a certain level. But he's very open about the fact that for a long time, what was behind his drive to become so successful mm -hmm. was this experience that he had when he was in middle school or high school. Are you familiar with this story? No, no. And so he grew up in New Jersey, a very affluent area in, in New Jersey or New York. I can't remember exactly. But one of his classmates showed up to school with, I think it was a Ferrari or a Lamborghini and gave everyone a ride, a chance to ride in the Lamborghini or the Ferrari, but him. And so his his drive, this mentality, right, this Mamba mentality that Kobe was a huge proponent of and became known for, was really just a compensating strategy to rub this kid's nose mm -hmm. <laughs> in not giving him a ride in his, in his Lamborghini when he was a kid. This hyper vigilant doership. Mm -hmm. This two sorts. Yeah, right. This high performer persona that many men rely on to become successful, it was always meant to fall apart. If you're on a personal development journey or on any classical spiritual schedule, eventually you will need to be led to the edge of your own private resources and you will need to be confronted by a hardship that you simply cannot deal with, which forces you back to the truth of who you are, back to your authentic self. Nothing else will do when you think about it. Nothing will cause us to let go of who we have become. Even if it's ineffective, it's, it works because it's what we're familiar with. It's what we're used to. Mm -hmm. Carl Jung refers to this as necessary suffering. We have to encounter or experience or go through necessary suffering in order to return to our true and authentic selves, where we finally know peace. Because we're no longer performing, we're no longer masking, we've got nothing to prove and nothing to protect. I am good enough as I am. So as we wind down, what is the first thing that you would say, anyone listening that's resonating with anything that we've been talking about, sure. where's the first place to start? Well, it starts with awareness. Mm -hmm. As you can probably imagine, awareness is, is the first step, self-awareness, self-management. If we're talking about cultivating a greater degree of emotional intelligence, which time and time again have been proven to be the catalyst for experiencing a greater degree of success in every area of life. Uh, but I think if I were to you know, leave the audience with like a question to ponder that will absolutely increase their conscious awareness around the internal barriers, the things that stop them from 
not just becoming more successful, but truly accessing peace, happiness, joy, and fulfillment is if my greatest strength is a compensating strategy, what is my greatest strength for? If you sit in the space of that question long enough, if you're brave enough to journal about it, it'll absolutely open up a lot for you, I promise. Such a fan of journaling and one of my most recommended strategies. Absolutely. Just putting the invisible visible. A hundred percent. Yeah. Yep. And I mean, 99 times out of 100, you will, if you sit with that long enough, if you journal on it enough, you will find and you'll uncover the different areas in your life in which you are overcompensating, in which you are performing, masking, playing a part, playing a role that is not necessarily you, but who you think you need to be or become in an attempt to be loved, accepted, and successful. Last question. Who, who, <laughs> who I think I need to be versus who I want to be. Who I am authentically. Yeah. Who right. I am authentically, I guess, is in, if I'm hearing you right, something that's revealed mm -hmm. rather than something that's selected. Is that right? Or how closely linked are those? Sure. Um, because sometimes I get someone could be saying who I think I should be is who I want to be. Who I think I should be is who I want to be. And who I want yeah. to be is who I am. Yeah, right. So well, just, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't, to be clear, I don't think everyone is doing this. Yeah. You know, but like I mentioned earlier, if you do anything long enough, you're going to become good at it and you're going to, you're going to like it. Yeah. And you're on, that is only, that trend is only going to continue. Mm -hmm. But purpose purpose is different purpose is a calling purpose is the thing that you can't not do mm -hmm. your divine design your divine design or your divine blueprint if you will it's it's your calling it's your curse it's the thing that you can't not do yeah that's so, how i feel about what i do sure yeah i think it, same i never wanted my face to be on the cover of a book I was very resistant to it. In fact, it wasn't my idea. It was my coach's idea at the time. And eventually I got on board with it because he was like, we, I want to show healing in action. What does it look like? Tangibly speaking. Mm -hmm. and I was like, okay, I'm on board with this, you know? Um, and so we did a regression experience. He literally walked me through the abuse that I suffered as a kid to relive the experience, which is a common modality uh, in, in therapy or in a coaching relationship so that you can grieve the incident and therefore release the emotions that were created because of it, the painful emotions. And he, we photographed it. Oh, cool. That's how that's the photo. That's the photo. That's awesome. So it was about a two, two and a half hour experience. Damn. And this was one of the last photos that we took because I was like, all oh, right, I think I'm done now. That's a professional photo too. You must have had a good photo it, camera. Yeah, <laughs> my, my, my buddy Sam Miller took that photo. He's Damn. a great photographer. He's one of the best portrait photographers Jeez, I've ever seen. Looks like it, bro. Um, yeah. And uh, we we got to know each other when I lived in Los Angeles and and he presided over the 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 photo shoot. It's amazing. And then my my coach walked me through the regression experience. Um excuse me. So I don't think everyone is doing this, mm -hmm. uh, to be clear, but I, I think you're like you resonated with. I think our, our purpose is the thing that we're called to do, mm -hmm. that we can't not do. It has little to do with desire. Passion is cultivated throughout the course of the process because of course you become better at what you're doing, mm -hmm. right? whether it's coaching or podcasting or writing. And e eventually the passion follows that, of course. But I think everyone has has a purpose to fulfill. Whether or not they actually get around to it is is a whole other conversation. What stands between us and living purpose, I believe, is resistance, which is the manifestation of unresolved or unreconciled pain. Nice bookend. Um, okay, so let's best place to find you and best place yeah. or places to get the book. Yeah, so you can obviously buy the book on Amazon. Let Love In, Jacob Kaufman, K-A-U-F-F-M-A-N. You can also go to my website, which is awakewithjake.com. Uh, and the best place to interact with me uh, is my Instagram handle, which is I am Jake Kaufman. 
Uh, so you can interact with me there, sign up for updates on my email list and keep in touch. Awesome. Well, thank you for your heart. Thank you for your wisdom. Thank you for the work that you do. And it was a pleasure to have you here, man. James, thank you so much, man. This was a great conversation. All right. Go out there, everybody. Be your own 1% and live on purpose. Thank you.